let me introduce Danny McCormick from Google, who is going to talk about inference at scale with Apache Beam. Hey, everyone. Uh, so yeah, uh, as mentioned, I'm Danny. Uh, I am a committer on the Beam project um, and uh, work at Google, where I guess I mostly do this full time, uh, which is great. Um, so uh, kind of to overview the talk, um, I'm going to start by just giving kind of a brief history and overview of what Beam is. and um, like kind of how it came to be, uh, that'll be fast. Um, and then like basically what it looks like to do inference with Beam. Um, and then I'm gonna spend most of the time talking about a few problems and solutions that we found people were kind of consistently running into um, and what we've baked into the Beam model to address that. Um, and then uh, really quick, just like where I see things going next uh, at the end. Um, so first of all, what's Beam? Um, so uh, just like show of hands, who here is familiar with Beam or like has some background? Okay, uh, cool. So like a mixed crowd, great. Um, so uh, I don't probably need to convince most of y'all that like uh, data got big. Uh, and um, not just that, we wanted to start uh, treating it as kind of a continuous stream. Um, and um, kind of, uh, so Beam came out of Google uh, originally. It was, it was donated to Apache and so, uh, and then went through the incubation process and all that. But uh, I think uh, kind of from a, a historical perspective, we started with MapReduce as kind of the main technology to address uh, the problem of uh, big data processing. Um, and I won't dive too deep into that because I, I think it's a pretty common tool. Uh, but um, basically like that works pretty well until you have like multiple reduces or you have kind of a more complex graph um, and so from that, uh, you get something that kind of looks like this with multiple persists and, um, you know, there are ways to make it better uh, and, you know, lots of, of tricks that people fit in. Um, but uh, kind of the uh, higher level thing that people noticed was that it is uh, potentially a, a lot easier to conceptualize this as a pipeline and provide kind of a top level model for people to interact with. Um, and allow the underlying execution engine to do its thing. Um, so out of that came Flume in Beam, um, which is where we have kind of a more modern uh, pipeline. Uh, this is uh, you know, not particularly novel today. There's tons of tools that are, are doing this. Um, I'm sure many of y'all have heard plenty of talks about tools that are doing this, um, but out of Flume came Beam. Um, and so Beam is uh, basically like just a, a, the, the outflow of this idea with a couple uh, of emphases. Um, emphases. Uh, and um, the first was a unified model for batch and streaming. Um, so uh, the idea that uh, batch data is just a special case of stream data. You know, you can either uh, process your data continuously um, or uh, you can process it in batches. But, you know, like even if you're processing it continuously, you can emit every day and, and it's basically just like the same problem. Um, and second is Beam has a big focus on portability. Um, so the idea of you can write with whatever language you want. Um, and even like Beam makes it easy to drop in Python machine learning code into your Java pipeline, for example, and kind of treat things a little bit more like microservice-y. Um, and that's def definitely like the direction that things are going right now. Um, and also build with whatever execution engine you want. So uh, you can build Beam pipelines on top of Spark, Flink, uh, you know, uh, Ray is coming around right now and uh, a bunch of other of these execution engines um, and Google has their own. Um, and even like Flume is kind of an internal Google execution engine at this point. Um, so that's like the overview of kind of the motivation behind Beam. Um, and so I'll jump into quick like basics. Uh, so just like to get on the same page terms that I'll be using potentially, uh, P collection is just your data. Um, so like a distributed data set that flows between transforms. Um, which transforms take one or more data sets, or I guess zero or more data sets, and produce uh, zero or more potentially different data sets. Um, and then a pipeline is a directed acyclic graph of transforms and peak collections. Acyclic here is important, and I'll call it out, especially in the machine learning context, because uh, it limits what you can do with distributed training. Um, it's not the best tool for that, probably, at this point. Um, so this is kind of it visualized. Um, I'll just kind of jump over this. Um, and this is what a basic Beam pipeline looks like. Um, I, I left it in Python mostly just to call out, there's this like funky pipe operator. Uh, if you're not 
familiar with Beam, you can just think of that as an apply, uh, and you'll see that kind of all over the examples today. Um, so in this case, it's like you've got your base pipeline, you apply a read from text, um, a map, and then a write from text. Uh, so, okay, enough about like basics. Um, so we're gonna jump into kind of the, the bulk of the talk, which is looking at Beam ML and especially inference. Um, and just to like start as a motivator, um, as you think about the ML lifecycle, uh, generally like there are some pieces that Beam's not going to touch. Like I said, training, like you, you can do online training in some forms of like, uh, if you can do single machine training, Beam's okay for that, but uh, it's, it's not really your distributed iterative model training uh, tool. Um, but outside of that, like validation, pre-processing, um, model validation, so like comparing two models or you know comparing the accuracy of a model, um, and then deployment are all things that Beam like can and should be good at, um, and and especially model deployment, which is kind of the focus today. Um, so jumping into inference, um, what we noticed was that uh, we saw users kind of running into the same gotchas and and issues, um, or just like writing the same boilerplate, uh, same tests over and over um, when they were trying to do machine learning inference with Beam. Um, and the specific like initial set of problems that we saw people running into is. Uh, in distributed systems, when you've potentially got multiple workers on a machine, it's hard to efficiently load models in a way that doesn't load too many copies, but definitely like still loads enough. Um, it's hard to do batching. Um, so especially like if you want to batch intelligently based off of the throughput of your pipeline, that's not trivial to do and kind of under requires understanding the model a little bit more deeply. Um, things like updating your model in live, a live pipeline and just like model ops generally. Uh, are hard. We'll see if the slides come back. Uh, there they are. Great. Um, and uh, just like plugging multiple models into your DAG uh, and dealing with the memory issues there. Um, so kind of our, our first pass and what we've evolved over time at solving that is uh, wrapping it up into a single transform and basically like uh, taking care of all of the boilerplate code that users write re repeatedly. Um, and handling things like uh, all the problems I mentioned before. Um, so um, we'll load the model efficiently. Uh, we will batch the input looking at the throughput of your pipeline to make kind of an intelligent decision about what the optimal batch size is to, to maximize uh, your model's throughput. Um, and it'll handle updates, which I'll talk about just like a little bit more late, later. Um, and it plugs nicely into your DAG um, and again, some memory magic that I'll, I'll talk about later. Um, so in practice, uh, all you need to do to run inference now is basically like provide the same information that you would provide locally. Um, and um, so for, for example, here we define our model handler, which is just your model configuration um, for which has your class, your weights, um, and anything else that you need to kind of load your model, um, any parameters that you want to pass in. Um, and that's kind of it. Uh, you, you uh, pass that into the run inference transform and it just works. Um, I think like the really powerful thing that we picked up here though, um, just with this kind of first pass was we learned users intent. Um, and I think that was the kind of the guiding principle for the rest of the improvements that we made along the way is like, now that we know users intent, we're able to um, build increasing layers of abstraction to kind of abstract away problems that we found people running into repeatedly. Um, so I'll do a quick demo. I have a long URL and a short URL if you trust me. Uh, but uh, just to kind of show what this looks like in practice um, and it's using Colab and um, so uh, this is not big enough. Let's see. Um, can y'all still, well, when the screen is there, can y'all still read that? Uh, you don't really need to be able to read the text, just the code. Um, Cool, so I'll, I'll skip over the dependency stuff. Um, but um, basically what we're going to do here is we're just going to run a really basic model handler. Um, in this case, I'm going to use Hugging Face Pipelines, um, which it's like a little more than a model. It's it, Hugging Face Pipelines, if you're not familiar, encapsulate a model and some pre and post processing tasks into kind of a single object. Um, so in this case, we're going to use the translation um, uh, task, um, which does what it sounds like. It translates text. Um, and the Google Flan model, um, there we go. Uh, and um, pass in some additional arguments that, I, I don't know if these are even actually totally necessary. They're just kind of showing off like 
some of the ways that you some of the things you can pass uh, when you use this particular model handler. Um, and again, like this is all the information that you would pass locally. And I'll, I'll have an example later where I I actually load a hugging face pipelines um, pipeline uh, next to a model handler so you can see. But basically, you're just providing configuration. Um, you can define your input examples. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, we're just going to do some text translation. Um, my Spanish isn't great, so I can't actually validate how, how good the translation will be. Um, and then this is the most popular, or uh, most complicated part of the demo is just like string interpolation. Um, so uh, you can plug each of those into the, the pipeline. So we create the text snippets that we created above. We use our, our model handler that we defined above, and we just have a, a format step. Um, and it'll go ahead and it'll download the model for you. Um, and um, once it finishes doing that, it'll take our examples and just print them nicely. Um, and so obviously, like this is all just running locally for me. Um, but it's basically the exact same if you're deploying your Spark cluster, your, your Flink cluster, whatever. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, so that's kind of the, the basic inference uh, process. Um, so now we can get into kind of the more like meaty problems. Um, so first of all, uh, we have something called automatic model refresh. Um, and this has to do with updates. So uh, kind of consistent problem that uh, I think everybody everywhere who has deployed a model faces is you get new data. Uh, and maybe you have a new training algorithm, um, but almost certainly you get new data. Uh, and out of that comes new models. Um, and what do you do? Um, so there are kind of three options uh, in Beam today. Uh, there used to just be two. One was you could stop your pipeline, update your model, and restart the pipeline. Um, two is you could do pipeline drains, um, which is basically letting all of the data flow out of your pipeline uh, and waiting until you reach kind of a stable point. Um, updating, um, that's a little bit better. It's a little bit faster and you don't have to like s totally stop the world. Um, but really like both of those options are not very good um, because you, you stop processing data, you have downtime. Um, and so we introduced this concept called automatic model refresh into Beam. Um, and so what this will do is it'll take your model and it'll hot swap your model in the live pipeline. Um, and um, again, because we're understanding intent, um, we're able to look at uh, kind of how large the model is and, and manage the memory for you to avoid downtime if you don't need it. Um, so obviously, like, if you've got a huge model and only one model will fit in memory, yeah, you either need to run two machines concurrently or you need to uh, have some downtime as you, you offload the previous model. Um, and, and that's the decision Beam will make right now is uh, it, it'll have a little bit of downtime in that case. Um, but again, because we understand intent, we're able to avoid as much downtime as possible. And even if you have that kind of downtime, you can still keep the rest of your pipeline flowing, um, which is important because most pipelines are more than just a single inference step. Um, in practice, uh, all that we really have to expose to a user is this idea of a model metadata P collection, which takes in a side input. A uh, side input is just like a secondary uh, input into your transform. Um, and uh, Users can define um, any incoming P collection that has their update, updated weights. Um, in this case, uh, for this example, I'm using the watch file pattern, which just like watches a directory and tells you if a, a file with new weights has been added. Um, but that pattern is uh, it's powerful for people who want to have, especially like long running streaming pipelines, um, which is a really important use case. Um, OK. On to large models. Um, and I'm just going to check how I'm doing time-wise. Cool. Um, so this is a topic that I'll, I'll probably spend a, a fairly long amount of time on, um, just because I think it's interesting and important, um, especially now with increasingly large models, uh, though maybe they'll be small again. We'll see. Um, so this is what a distributed runner will usually look like. Um, and I say usually, like, it depends on what architecture or uh, what runner you're running on top of, and um, some of the configuration options you can make. But typically, you're going to have a VM, and you're going to have a bunch of worker processes spun up inside of that uh, VM. And um, 
often, uh, you know, at least like some runners, and I think probably the optimal configuration for most pipelines is to have one worker process per core, um, uh, just because Python's, uh, for a Python pipeline, I should say, because Python's not always incredible with concurrency beyond that. Um, and then maybe you'll have a bunch of threads within that worker process uh, that are doing different pieces of work and IO and stuff. Um, that works great if you've got a small model because you can fit a bunch of small models in memory. Uh, you can load all of those models and you can process things in parallel. You can leverage all your cores and everybody's happy. Um, but what about if you have a large model? Um, so. If you were just kind of deploying a large model onto a, a VM, you might end up with a configuration that looks like this, where you've got a bunch of processes or, or maybe just a bunch of threads doing I.O. and they're all feeding your, your model. Um, and I say I.O. I.O. here can also mean like some pre-processing, post-processing um, type operations. Um, so that's problematic because that does not really map to the normal beam model um, because Traditionally, um, Beam has not had awareness of like from one worker to another, how many workers are on a machine. And um, in general, like most distributed data processing systems assume some level of independence between their workers. Um, you can also have situations like this where maybe like your first model you can load uh, onto, you can only load one model onto your VM, um, your second model or, and your third model can both fit. Um, and again, like in your ideal world, you have kind of this model packing problem um, where you want to fit as many models in memory as you can, or like, I don't know, it, it depends a little bit on how you're trying to configure things, but, um, and, and what you're trying to optimize for. But you, you want kind of a finer grain control over the number of models that appear, and you don't just want to blindly load all of your models into every process, uh, or else you'll fall over with memory issues. Um, so the question then is, how do we map those configurations to this? Um, so coming back to the small model configuration, it's really easy. Uh, you don't have to do anything, and you can just run inference. Uh, the one thing that we do, which I, I mentioned, is we do share the model uh, across threads for a single process. Um, and basically, we do, do that because uh, it can be prohibitive to not do that even with smaller models. Um, and we didn't really see any performance differences there. Um, Okay, uh, getting into the more interesting case, um, let's assume you have a larger model that looks like this. Um, so what Beam did uh, is it, because we, again, understand intent, um, we broke down uh, the idea that workers can't be aware of each other for this specific case um, and introduced kind of the concept of a central inference process. Um, so using Python's multiprocessing library, uh, the worker processes will send uh, data across to this inference process that is spun up uh, the first time that any worker encounters a run inference step that requires it. Um, so in practice, uh, all users have to do to consume it is add a large model equals true setting. Um, and Beam will uh, set up that additional inference process and um, basically like uh, map all of the data into that process. Um, so there's uh, a single point where we need to load the model. Um, and so this takes on some inter-process communication. Um, and obviously, like, you lose parallelism, but that's somewhat unavoidable if you've got a single model in memory. Um, uh, then we get into the large model configuration. And our solution here is, like, very similar, uh, but uh, a little bit more, like, uh, built on top. Um, so instead of just having a single inference process, uh, we introduce the idea of a model manager. Um, and I think like this is indicative of where Beam inference is going long term, of have this central model manager process that has the ability to spin up uh, various different inference processes um, that can load models and it can do things like pack the machine as, as full as it can go. Um, and so, um, this model manager, uh, each worker process registers with it. Um, it spins up models as needed. Um, so the worker says, I need this model, um, and it'll spin up a process to load that model. Um, it can offload models as needed. Um, so uh, if you're running out of space, um, let's say you have just like one machine to work with and you've got three models and only two fit into memory, you, know, you wanna be able to onload and offload models intelligently. 
Right now, it's just kind of an LRU. Uh, so like it'll, it'll evict the least recently used model. Um, but I think over time, we have room to be more intelligent here. Um, and uh, again, using this uh, is, is not too hard because um, uh, we already have the kind of core intent from um, inference. Uh, from run inference. So um, all we really like require of users here uh, is to pass in this key model mapping. Um, so what this means is that um, for any uh, examples that are keyed by keys one, two, or three, uh, let's map that to the model represented by this first model handler. Um, and likewise, any keys or any examples that are keyed by foo, bar, or baz, map it to the second model handler. Um, so I'll, I'll do a kind of quick demo of this as well. Um, so uh, again, uh, notebook. Um, I will say too, uh, all of these notebooks are available in the Beam repo. Um, so um, along with uh, a bunch more around inference, um, I'm actually gonna wait on this install because uh, I don't know why. Colab is kind of weird about dependencies sometimes and it doesn't like this install unless we uh, restart our runtime. Um, but while I'm doing that, uh, I'll talk about kind of the main pipeline. Um, so uh, just to kind of give you an overview of where we are going, um, this is the pipeline that we're going to run. Um, let's shrink that a little so it all fits. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create some examples, um, format them um, into those key uh, into the key value pairs um, so that we can use the key model mapping I mentioned above. Uh, we're going to run inference. Um, and um, again, this inference step is going to be over multiple models. Um, we'll do, again, some like string interpolation. Um, and then we'll group the models by uh, example. Um, and this will allow us to easily compare the results of two models when we print them. Um, so I'll, I'll go through step by step to kind of show this. Um, so um, yeah, there we go, it restarted. <laughs> um, so we can do our imports. And um, here's where we define our two model handlers that we care about. Um, and I also just like kind of for convenience downloaded the two models um, so that we can compare them. So again, we're using Hugging Face Pipelines. We're gonna do text classification. For one, we're using um, this BERT uh, model. And for the other, we're using Roberta. Uh, and um, they're both like pretty small models because they had to fit in my collab environment. Uh, but in practice, uh, you can imagine running this with larger models that you can kind of swap in and out of memory. Um, so uh, you'll notice like the model handler doesn't actually download it, but the pipelines are doing that. Um, so we can look at these locally. Um, so uh, once those complete, we can run our models just against kind of a toy example. Um, and I'll skip that for expediency, but you can see they produce different results uh, in kind of the cache results. Um, we can define some examples. Um, and in this case, I've defined them with sentiment, so, or uh, with, with their classification so that we can easily um, compare them at the end. Um, uh, it's fine, I think it is what it is, yeah, thanks. Uh, and uh, this is probably like the, the most complicated part of this demo is just uh, mapping these to keys. Um, so what we're doing is uh, we're, we're taking each element um, and the examples are the first part, the sentiment is the second part. And we're creating keys that are, are created from the sentiment basically uh, so that we have the class as part of our key. Um, in practice, you could avoid this with a join later on, but uh, this is just to avoid a join. Um, and then we're putting the examples in the value. Um, so what we'll end up with is a key set that looks like this, um, where each example is keyed by its model name and its sentiment. Um, and we can use those keys to map to the correct model handler. Um, so in this case, all keys with the distillbert uh, prefix will map to that model handler and the Roberta prefix will map to the Roberta model handler. Um, and we've also included a hint on the max number of models to load per worker. Um, so uh, this will allow us to, in, in this case, we only have two models, so it's not doing a whole lot. Um, but this is the kind of magic that uh, variable that allows us to say, I only want to load this many models onto my worker. 
Um, here we're just extracting our results after inference and um, printing them. So I'll, I'll kind of skip over those uh, for expedience. Um, but we can run our pipeline. Um, and again, like with just kind of that simple key model map mapping and uh, the run inference transform, um, we're able to compare these two models. Um, so um, you can see we've, we've got predictions from both of these. Um, and I think one model is a little bit better than the other. But. Um, cool. Um, so the last uh, kind of challenge or, or I guess like important area that we touched on was uh, working well with specialty hardware. Um, so you, uh, very often in production, you wanna run with GPUs or TPUs. Um, and so like, obviously that's gonna be super dependent on your runner and configuration um, and just like what is available. Um, but Beam does have some primitives that will help. Um, again, like pending your, your runner's support. Um, so um, one concept is the idea of resource hints for heterogeneous pools. Um, so basically what this allows you to do is um, beam jobs are divided into stages of like fused together um, transforms. Um, so if you have like three mappings in a row, they'll all be combined into one. Uh, this allows you to annotate those with hints like I want this to run in a GPU. I want this to run with uh, or with a GPU driver attached. I want this to run with just CPU. Um, and that allows you to avoid, uh, well, it, it gives you two things. One, it allows you to avoid uh, using your GPU for the entire job, which is obviously expensive. But two, it, it kind of solves um, some of the memory management problems as well. Um, so you can create different environments uh, for different large models so that you're not loading them at the same time as well. Um, so it's, it's related to some of what we were just talking about. Um, second, um, there's kind of, uh, model handler level detection and uh, reaction to GPUs. Um, so for example, uh, if you're using the PyTorch model handler, um, there's some special uh, configs that get set, set if you're expected to use GPUs and um, it'll flag if there's not actually a GPU present um, or vice versa. Um, and then lastly, this large model setting is pretty interesting for GPUs. Um, so uh, if we can hopefully get the picture back. Uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, so um, often if you just have like, for example, a single GPU driver attached to your mach machine, um, it is not super efficient to run inference on that GPU from eight different processes. Um, and so this large model configuration also kind of doubles as a let this process be the one to access the GPU. Um, now with that said, NVIDIA's made some pretty good strides here too uh, with their MPS uh, multi-process uh, service. Um, so some of this isn't as necessary anymore, um, but it kind of varies what hardware you're running on, how useful it is. Um, cool. So uh, just in terms of like where I see things going next, uh, and I have this little disclaimer, it's just my opinion. Uh, uh, so I think like within inference, um, you know, always we can use more frameworks. Like right now we support, I think PyTorch, SKLearn, XGBoost, TensorFlow, uh, a bunch of model hubs like Hugging Face, uh, TensorFlow Hub, and even some remote inference like Vertex AI. But I think like it'd be cool to support even more. And I think especially like remote endpoints, um, you know, it would be cool if you could run this against, uh, like Hugging Face has uh, endpoints concept. You know, it would be cool if you could do remote inference against that, for example. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of opportunity in that space. Um, obviously, obviously there's like always performance improvements to be found. And I think like that's a, a point of emphasis that we should have moving forward. Um, and then really being creative of now that we've got people's models and like, we know, we know we are working with somebody's model, uh, in that model manager process. Um, how can we find ways to, uh, create more, um, more kind of optimizations in how we run that and more uh, strategies that are a little bit smarter about how we load and unload the model um, or models, I should say. Um, and then beyond inference, I think like BeamML just has a lot of room to grow. Uh, there's uh, already a concept of an ML transform, which is uh, questionable naming, I guess, but uh, it's a little generic. Uh, but for data prep and pre and post processing and um, 
like room for better feature store connector connections and um, vector store as well. And um, then like also kind of what we've done here, but with higher level operations. Um, so I think just like more understanding people's intent and optimizing the underlying graph, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, I guess increasing the layers of abstraction in the ML space. So uh, yeah, if you're interested, um, come contribute. Uh, and I, I think that's it. So if anybody has any questions, now's the time. I didn't really understand the concept of model key mapping. And sure. yeah, if you just kind of elaborate a bit and yeah. Um, so basically the idea is um, oftentimes you will want to run inference uh, on different models at the same time. Uh, so a good example, a good motivating example of this is uh, let's say you have two models that you want to compare, um, or potentially you have like a model per customer. So often you'll want to run kind of inference at the same step against multiple different models at the same time. Um, so uh, this, like in the example, this would allow us to uh, like run uh, some set of keys against this first model, um, some other set of keys against the second model, um, and basically like tailor the pipeline to the data that we're running it against. It's not like you're rooting the traffic, like. You want to infer. You're sending traffic, so you have traffic to a specific model? Right, yeah. So you could think about it like conceptually as you have two transforms side by side. Um, but this allows you to just like with config, specify a single transform. Um, oftentimes, especially if you have, for example, a model per customer, uh, you might have a lot of models. Uh, and so like this will support like hundreds or thousands of models at once, it's very small. Uh, yeah, and they can be large too, but you're probably going to have a lot more regression on the ads. Um, so that allows us to encapsulate it with a single transform. Um, but the model manager has the potential to give that case to just like more generally manage your model and then maybe like respond. Great. Right. Uh, but the model manager needs this in order to kind of spread or split the. Yeah. Well, to, Today it does, um, because this was like the most common use case where we found people doing this, because they can use uh, the resource links to spin up multiple tools for different stages otherwise. Um, but that's not really like a technical limitation, it's just a really simple feature sort of limitation. Thanks. Cool. More a general question, I guess. I mean, with the long list of runtimes you support, uh, running on GPUs or some of the maybe newer stuff going on in the industry has that been kind of problematic for you guys, or is it whatever the runtime can do to perform a thing job that you want to kind of again later? Or like, uh, yeah, I think to some degree, yeah, it's, it's that. Uh, and uh, part of the like uh, the vision for me, I guess, was that it's easy to switch or like at least it should be easy. I don't want to speak to people's experience, but you know, like it, it should be easy to switch between runtimes. So, like, if you need a certain feature that's not available more than one runtime, you know, you have to avoid it entirely. Uh, and that was kind of a core, like a core beam decision is portability is important. So, yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you.